Things sure haven't changed. It's a simple business. Oil and gas companies <laughs> acquire land that they believe has energy locked away beneath it. Then they drill holes, install wells, extract the energy, and get it to market. If they can sell the energy for more than it they spend on the land in getting it out of the ground, they make a healthy living. But it's a boom and bust industry, and in the 80s, it busted. Enter the frackers. Over the last few years, they've led a production boom that has made our country more energy independent and more recently helped cause oil prices to fall due to oversupply. Conventional drilling involves making a hole in the ground and sucking out pools of energy, but sometimes the energy is stuck in the rocks. Hydraulic fracturing, or fracking, pushes a bunch of water, chemicals, and sand into the rocks, breaking them apart to release the trapped energy. The best results come from combining fracking with horizontal drilling, where the well turns horizontally underground to better penetrate the energy-bearing rock. In some places, the rocks hold oil, lots and lots of oil. The frackers have found significant amounts in three major basins the Bakken in North Dakota, the Eagleford in South Texas, and the Permian in West Texas. Fracking is expensive. Buying the land, setting up infrastructure, and drilling the holes costs money, lots and lots of money. So the frackers took their story to Wall Street, explaining how fracking is a new way to get rich in oil. The large oil frackers have spent $80 billion more than they've received from selling oil. Wall Street greased the skids by underwriting debt and equity securities that allowed them to garner billions in fees. The banks are clearly incentivized to enable the frack addicts. What's less obvious is whether the investors are furnished a clear analysis of the returns these companies actually generate. Behind me is a quote from an investor I always listen to, Stan Druckenmiller. He said it better than I could. If you give a driller a dollar, he's going to drill a hole. And true to form, the frackers drilled holes, lots and lots of holes. In fact, all the capital these companies generated internally, plus proceeds from asset sales, plus financing from investors, went to drilling holes. The top 16 oil frackers alone drilled a third of a trillion dollars worth of holes. As oil prices rose, it seemed like the frackers should have been drowning in cash, but none of them generated excess cash flow, not even when oil was at $100 a barrel. In fact, the opposite was true. They responded to higher oil prices with even more aggressive capital spending, financed ever more cheaply by Wall Street. The result was that the higher oil price led to even greater cash burn. Last year, with $100 oil, the group burned $20 billion. The frackers insist that they are investing for growth, which leads investors to ignore gap financials in favor of non-traditional metrics like EBITDAX. EBITDAX, in case you're wondering, basically stands <laughs> for earnings before a lot of stuff. It's not an SEC-reported measure. The capital spending of an oil-producing well is done up front, but the oil comes out over many years. As the oil gets sold, companies expense the corresponding part of the prior capital spending. This is called depletion, which is what the D in EBITDAX stands for. But investing for growth is a fiction. Unlike many businesses where investment spending toward works towards building a durable asset, a franchise value, and a recurring revenue stream, here the CapEx goes towards reducing the assets one barrel at a time. Once you extract the oil from the ground, that's it, poof, it's gone. The mantra from the frackers and the bankers that profiteer from funding them is that energy investors don't look at gap earnings. 
Depletion gets ignored because it's not a cash item, and CapEx gets ignored because it's funding future growth. In truth, both get ignored because these metrics don't support the story they want to tell. One useful rule of thumb, when someone doesn't want you to look at traditional metrics, it's a good time to look at traditional metrics. In frac country, CapEx has averaged 75% of revenues over the past eight years. Depletion is a real expense. By asking investors to ignore CapEx when it's spent and the depletion when the oil is produced, the industry wants us to look only at the cash that comes out of the business while completely ignoring the cash that goes into it. Recently, oil prices have declined. Because the frackers have less revenue, they've been forced to cut CapEx. Though they will continue to spend more dollars than they take in, production is no longer growing. A business that burns cash and doesn't grow isn't worth anything. The numbers I'm walking through today generally apply to the large publicly listed shale oil companies such as those shown here. Notably, I am not talking about the natural gas frackers, which are globally competitive, low-cost energy producers with attractive economics. Let's drill down deeper into one of the biggest oil frackers in the world. It's well-loved, well-located, and well-run. <laughs> we call it the mother fracker. But everyone else will know it as Pioneer Natural Resources, ticker PXD. Pioneer owns assets primarily in the Permian Basin, America's biggest shale oil field. It has some assets in Eagleford. It's the second largest pure play shale oil producer behind EOG, which I guess would be the father fracker. Pioneer closed Friday at about $172 a share, giving it a $26 billion market cap and an enterprise value of $27 billion. It trades at a fancy multiple of last year's earnings before oil prices fell. Aided by its profitable hedges, Pioneer will barely avoid reporting a loss this year. Next year, prices are expected to recover enough for Pioneer to earn about a buck and a half a share. Since 2006, Pioneer has spent close to $19 billion in gross capex. That was funded by $12 billion in cash from operations, $5 billion of asset sales, and $2 billion of equity raises. The cartoon says, oh, that $2 billion. We think that in the current environment, Pioneer earns a negative economic return on capex. Let's do the math. First, some terminology, though. Approved reserve is an SEC term which is, in essence, a promise of a future oil and gas. Reserves are expressed in barrels of oil equivalent, or BOE, which is a combination of barrels of oil, natural gas liquids, or NGLs, and cubic feet of natural gas. So how fast have Pioneer's reserves grown from all that spending? They really haven't grown at all. Even based on last year's very high commodity prices, Pioneer's proved reserves have been flat to down. Proved reserves come in two designations, developed and undeveloped. A developed reserve has no more capital costs associated with it. The hole's been drilled and the well has been completed and hooked into the transport system. The energy is either being sold or is ready to be sold. Undeveloped reserves usually involve wells in progress or soon to be drilled. In other words, they still have major future costs associated with them. The big capital spending comes from creating developed reserves. How much does it cost Pioneer to create a developed reserve? This chart looks at Pioneer cumulatively over the past nine years. It has grown its developed reserves by about 30 million BOE and taken about 470 million out of the ground. So it has developed about 500 million BOE. CapEx net of asset sales during the same period has been $14 billion, meaning reserves have cost $28 per BOE to develop. Just about half of Pioneer what they produce is oil. A bit over a quarter is natural gas and the rest are NGLs. Despite energy equivalents, gas and NGLs sell at a big discounts to crude oil. So while WTI trades at about $59 per barrel, natural gas trades at the equivalent of $17 a barrel, and NGLs at only $23 a barrel. 
After paying for transport costs at spot commodity prices, Pioneer's revenues averaged $36 per BOE compared to the $59 headline price for crude. On the $36 of revenue per BOE, Pioneer spends $14 on field operating expenses and another $6 on corporate expenses. Subtract the historical capex of 28 and Pioneer loses $12 for every BOE it develops. That's like using $50 bills to counterfeit 20s. Of course, oil prices aren't expected to stay at 59. That's what the cur this is what the current forward curve, or strip for WTI, looks like. You can see that prices are expected to recover to about $64 next year and $68 in the long term. Lower commodity prices are forcing the industry to cut costs. Here we adjust the revenue to the future strip price and cut expenses by 20%. On that basis, gross cash flow is $30 per BOE. Pioneer earns a positive margin, but it's not a positive value. You have to take the time value of money into account. A well is paid for upfront, but the oil, and hence the revenue, come out over 50 years. Pioneer has an 8.4% weighted average cost of capital. When you take that into account, the present value of the cash flows falls to $16 per BOE 